Okay, let's flip this thing around and see. Uh... Hey everyone, uh, this is such amateur hour. This is Steve Weintraub with uh, Collider.com. I'm at 20th Century Fox, and uh, this is what it looks like uh, on the Fox lot. And I'm here about to show you the editing room with uh, Dark Phoenix writer-director Simon Kinberg and producer Hutch Parker. Um, so I think a lot of people don't react. Shit. Uh, I think a lot of people, I'm going to put you two closer together, I think a lot of people don't realize that the editing room is not some glamorous place, so we're going to hopefully uh, um, uh, dispel the myth that uh, editing is uh, super glamorous. All right. Um, okay, so do you want to take us in? Sure. Come on in. And with people in the comments, if you can't hear anything or anything like that, let us know. Uh, welcome to the editing room for, uh, for Sweet, for Dark Phoenix. We have this the... is a refrigerator full <laughs> of water. This is a very um, cheap uh, conference table. Um, there's a coffee maker, um, his and hers bathrooms. Um, empty bottles of water there. Uh, we have different people working um, on the various things uh, for the movie, whether it's visual effects um, or obviously ed editorial. Uh, some empty calendars. Um, uh, Poster that fans might like. Um, and, and was this poster put up when? Uh, right at the beginning? Right, yeah, early on in the process. Um, Anything we should know about this poster, or this is just a cool X Men poster? It's just a cool X Men poster. There's no <laughs> meaning to it, but I'm sure much will be ascribed to it. This is where we watch a lot of the time um, the uh, visual effects that we get in. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's safe for me to walk in. It's probably not. Um, <laughs> this is a ping pong table uh, that I promised um, our editor that you're going to meet in a second, Lee Smith. If he did the movie, um, we would have a ping pong table because when I worked with him before, he's a ping pong master, and uh, I was part of the deal. He edited Master and Commander, um, in addition to editing most, if not all, of Chris Nolan's movies, including all the Dark Knight films. Come none on. of the none of this audience has seen the Dark Knight movies. You should watch them; they're really good. Right. This is Lee Smith. He's an Academy Award winning for Dunkirk. Um, should have also won for Inception and many other movies. Uh, uh, editor. He's also six foot eleven inches tall. Is that true? No, he's very tall. Close, very tall. He's very tall. Very tall. I was going to say that uh, I also um, uh, love uh, this movie called Inception. I think that's what we call a great film. Thank you. Yeah. Very good, very good film to work on. Right. So, um, so real quick. So I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna pan too far to the left because that could be uh, interesting. But so there's some. What's behind you? Uh, concept art uh, from well before we started shooting the movie. Um, both of which are scenes that ended up in the film. Um, uh, the top one is a little different in the movie visually, but it's essentially the neighborhood that is in the film. Um, and the bottom one is uh, a little different visually, but the same idea um, and will actually be something that we will be showing um, uh, this week at Comic-Con. Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to say you guys are, are doing a New York Comic-Con. Yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, so real quick, so I want to show people, um, and hopefully the screen screen's safe for me to pan to, right? Uh, so this is, uh, for people that don't realize that this is where like a Hollywood movie is actually made. It's you guys sitting in a room like this with you and looking at these screens for a very long time. True. Or am I wrong about this? <laughs> no, you're, you're right about it. Right? You're right. <laughs> Lee lives in that seat more than he lives anywhere else in the world. Yeah, I can't stand. <laughs> right. What's interesting, though, is this is a big editing room compared to some that I've been in. Physically big? Yeah. Wow. I've been in some rooms that are, like, uh, much smaller than this. Um, so uh, they, they clearly like you. They've well, get... if you had come to see um, <laughs> us doing the, when we did the pickups uh, in Montreal for this film, um, the editing room that, that Lee had indicated that they did not like him. Because uh, <laughs> it was a very <laughs> small room. This big. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. But uh, it was... Uh, it was it, payback it, for some crime. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm just going to ask, but um, is there anything, so this w this shot on the screen, anything you want to tell people? Or is this just like a cool shot? Uh, it's a cool shot. Um, if they come to Comic-Con uh, this week, they'll see the context um, of the shot. Uh, cool. I have a few questions I'm going to ask, so I'm going to grab a seat here. Okay. And, uh, and Lee, if you want, you're allowed to stand down and continue. <laughs> right. And actually, you want me to stay? I don't mind. 
You can. We're just going to talk. Okay. okay. I'm yep. going to go watch the All right. It Thank you, Lee. You uh, want to watch, see how tall Lee is now? Hold on. Pan all the way up. Oh, yeah. Room. I'd say, yeah. Massive. Yeah, Massive. no, no, you're you're not you're uh, you're a little taller than me. You definitely have to fly in a, a economy plus. I wouldn't even know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, oh. Okay, no worries. I apologize, by the way, for all the people that are watching, and I could not figure out how to make it go like that. Um, so I, so everyone just got dizzy when who's uh, now watching. Um, so for Simon, I'm going to start uh, start off with uh, how long did you know this is your first time. Uh, directing. Yeah. Uh, how long did you know that you wanted to actually direct? Um, well, I, I, I went to film school. Uh, I, I focused on screenwriting there, but I always loved um, the directing projects. And to me, there's a sort of fluidity of making movies. Obviously, directing is a different job than writing or producing, but a lot of the movies I worked on were with very collaborative directors. And so I felt like there was, even though different you know, definitions and, and titles, there was some flexibility, fluidity in terms of the roles we played. So I've always wanted to direct. Uh, I just always wanted to be sure it was a story I felt uniquely suited to tell. And uh, why'd you want to do the Dark Phoenix storyline? Well, it was my favorite storyline in the X-Men comics growing up. Um, the X-Men comics were my favorite comics growing up. Uh, and I felt like I had a way into this, this uh, iteration of it, this adaptation of it, um, that I could see in my head. Um, so that's why. Um, th you've written a lot of scripts, but this is your first time writing script, knowing you're going to direct it. Mm -hmm. What is that like in terms of, how is that, you know, different? Um, it's interesting. Um, it's different in a few ways. It's different technically because I felt less responsibility to describe things on the page because yeah. I felt like I would have the opportunity to mm -hmm. describe it to the production <clears throat> designer and the cinematographer and Hutch um, as the producer and really create a partner on the movie uh, and to the actors directly, um, which I'd done to some extent on other movies, but not this this um, consistently. Uh, and then the other part of it, I guess, emotionally was, you know, being a writer when you don't direct is a little bit like you raise a child because you write that script and then you hand it to another parent at a certain point. Um, and this time I was the person that raised the child and basically parented with all these partners but parented the child all the way through and so writing the script I felt this feeling of like safety um in in writing it uh that I didn't feel on other movies because you just never know no I, completely um over what time period does the movie take place how many days does it take place over or when does it take place oh I'll do both actually <laughs> I'll do both okay uh, uh it takes place in 1992 nine years after apocalypse we've as you, as the fans would know we've been skipping uh, a decade, decade, decade from X-Men First Class. We went from the 60s to then the 70s and Days of Future Past, then the 80s and Apocalypse, and this time the 90s in, um, in, in our movie, in Phoenix. So it's 1992, and it takes place roughly over the span of, well, it starts um, earlier, but the vast majority of the movie takes place um, over probably about a week time. Uh, what can you tease about Jessica Chastain's role? Yeah, ask that question quite a lot. Um, <laughs> I can tease that she is uh, not of this world, uh, that she is an extraterrestrial character. Um, I can tease that she does some pretty wonderful things with it. Um, beyond that, in terms of uh, where she comes from specifically in our universe um, uh, and what she's based on in the comics, uh, I guess I will say uh, she's sort of an amalgam of, of a couple different um, characters and iterations of those characters over the span of the different tellings of the Dark Phoenix story that have taken place. So the, with her, it's I think it's awesome that you got her. Uh, was it tough to get her to be in the movie? Was she a fan of the superhero genre? Um, she was a fan of uh, the superhero genre because I think she was seeing how many great actors were, were doing these films, and she was excited about an opportunity to do something so wildly different than what she had done before. I mean, one of the things that's amazing about Jessica is, on the one hand, she is... A movie star on the other hand she is a character actor and so i think each time she does a film she wants to do something really different challenge herself to do something tonally different to do something um even aesthetically different uh uh and just like in in terms of what she inhabits each each role is very different so that excited her jess and i go back to um the martian which i produced and she was in and we became friends 
really after that film, uh, we, became, we became very good friends. Um, and so when I was writing the part, I was thinking about Jess. Uh, and I sent it to her. And I think the themes of the movie, which um, there's a lot of themes that, that, that appealed to her. I think the notion that it was a female-centered movie, that it was a female movie about female empowerment, that it was a movie that was about um, the dangers of misusing power at a time when, you know, the world is experiencing that, not just cinema, uh, appealed to her. And I think the character itself um, appealed to her just because it was so different. Hutch, you've worked with Simon many times. This is your first time working with him as a director. Uh, what was that experience like? Maybe what surprised you? Um, good question. Um, experience was great, but, but we've, we've been working together for so long now. It's pretty, it's pretty effortless and, and pretty easy. You know, we, we, we go back to X2, kind of uh, when I was at the studio and into X3 and, mm -hmm. and beyond. So we have a lot of shared history in terms of these movies and then producing together on these many movies. Um, you know, he, he segued into the director role pretty seamlessly. You know, I think, I think has been quietly studying the job with a lot of really, as he mentioned, some, some extraordinary filmmakers. And then, uh, you know, the team we had on the movie, with a few exceptions, are all people we've worked with before between the actors as well as key crew. Um, so we really had uh, a tight-knit family um, who was comfortable and used to working together and, frankly, was really excited about Simon making this transition. And as you alluded earlier, when, you know, one of the benefits of his writing the script that he was then going to direct is very early on we could be having kind of production conversations and production awareness even mm -hmm. even as he was evolving the script you were getting to talk to the director you know mm -hmm. so it was a big help in terms of you know getting everything aligned getting everything prepped properly uh worked out in, in advance of showing up on set and the only other thing was how you never I, i've worked with a lot of first-time directors um and you never really know based on conversations going into that what they're going to be like on set and, and what that first day will be like. And, you know, Simon just seemed so at home. He seemed completely comfortable and relaxed and kind of in the game in a way that, that I've rarely seen. So it was, it was fun in addition to everything else. Well, I, I, I'll, 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 that's very kind. Thank you. Um, what I will say is, is having Hutch there uh, helped keep me calm, um, made me feel like uh, any problems that, that would arise um, you could take care of. Um, he's the enforcer. Uh, and, and, and also it really helped me focus entirely on the actors um, uh, and we worked with Mara Fiore who's an Academy Award winning cinematographer who shot Avatar Lee Smith who you just met Academy Award winning editor who, who's done so many great movies we had this incredible crew of people and like I said this, this family of actors it's almost like a, like a theater troupe yeah. of actors uh, most of whom it was my our fourth movie working with them. A couple of them, it was our second movie for me. Jessica, even as a new member of the X-Men family, was my second movie working with her. Um, so it felt like walking into a familiar environment. And obviously I'm so familiar, we're all so familiar with the X-Men as a comic fan growing up, as a cartoon a fan of cartoons growing up. And then obviously as someone who's been involved in, I don't know what it is now, eight or nine of these movies in one form or another between Deadpool and, and Logan and, and, and the X-Men movies, it all felt um, uh, just very, f I felt fluent in it. Um, it was made that transition easier. Uh, I love the line in the trailer. The trailer recently came out. I love the line in the trailer where Magneto says, uh, you're always sorry, Charles, and there's always a speech and nobody cares. Mm -hmm. uh, how much fun is it writing Magneto and Xavier lines when they're debating each other? And what can you tease about their dynamic in Dark Phoenix? That's my favorite line too, by the way. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's why my favorite line in the trailer. Um, Part of what I like about the line in the trailer, urged in the movie, is that it indicates that it's a very different kind of X-Men movie than we've had in the past. Um, and I've loved the other X-Men movies, obviously, like I was a fan of X-1 and 2 of Brian's first two films. Um, I'm very proud of Days of Future Past and, and all of the movies that we worked on. Um, but they all have had a particular kind of, Matthew's movie is quite, quite different, but, but they've had a particular kind of sort of prosaic, almost operatic tone to them. Um, and this one, is, I guess I would call it more um, uh, grounded, real, human, um, uh, maybe more emotional, hopefully more emotional, I should say. 
uh, but certainly less operatic. Um, and so people don't get to get away with making speeches. Um, and the things that we've done for many movies um, over the last 20 years now, it's been of making X-Men movies, um, I didn't want the characters to get away with or simply repeat in this film. So that was not just in the dialogue and the storytelling, but also even in the performances. I mean, the way that I talked to the actors and the way that the actors approached this film was much more like a drama um, in their performance than it was like a big operatic superhero film, um, which is another thing I think that got Jessica excited and got Michael and James and Nick and Jennifer and Sophie and Ty and the rest of this extraordinary cast excited too, because I was saying to them, treat it more like the independent movies you guys are in, like a David Russell movie for Jennifer or um, you know a Steve McQueen movie for Michael Fassbender than a big operatic, um, uh, you know, larger than life film, even though obviously there's a whole slew of larger than life things that are happening because the scale and the scope and the fact that they have superpowers and laser beams that come out of their eyes. It's not a David or Russell movie. Um, uh, but it is the, probably the most fun to write for um, Charles and Eric because one, their friendship is so deep and complicated. Um, that's just, that's what's true in the original movie is it's true in this iteration of the, the younger version of the characters. Um, it's true in the comic books. Uh, and also, um, we've been very lucky to get these extraordinary actors to play them, both yeah. in Patrick and Ian and in Michael and James, and arguably some of, if not the greatest actors of their generation. And so to know as a writer that you're writing for these kinds of actors, one, it sort of forces you to, to raise your game because to, you don't want to show up on set and hand Michael Fassbender or Ian McKellen bad dialogue, you know, when they just came off of whether it's a Steve McQueen movie or playing King Lear for, for, for Ian, you don't want to hand him, you know, bad ex expository dialogue. Uh, and, and two, there is a safety about it as well, which is, you know, candidly, that you could hand the phone book to Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen, James, and Michael, and it's going to sound good because their voices are extraordinary and they're great actors. I, I heard they're okay. They're pretty good. Yeah. They're pretty good in everything they do. By the way, completely sidebar, but how excited are you to see Patrick Stewart play Picard again? I mean, because I'm personally losing my mind. Yeah, no. I, I'm in, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, a, a good friend of mine and actually my mentor, Kiva Goldsman, um, is involved in that show and he was talking to me about it before they, they got Patrick to say yes. And I was like, if you get that, that's, you know, about as big a, an event as you can have in the Star Trek universe. Um, the person who was geeking out the most about it, I would say, actually, that was um, McAvoy. Um, I'm going to actually put a pitch in for McAvoy right now. I'll tell you this, too. But if they ever need a flashback scene of young Picard, James really wants to play the young Picard <laughs> in, in, in that movie. He wants to make a career of playing young Patrick Stewart. That's amazing. That's, and that would also be just too funny. You know what I mean? Yeah, he would do it for free. I, 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 that I'll leave up to him. But he would certainly, he really wants to do it. But leave it at that. That's great. Um, you got something that I'm so excited about, and I think a lot of fans are excited about, is getting Hans Zimmer mm -hmm. to come back to do another superhero movie. How did you get Hans to come back? I heard that maybe you and the cast visited him when he was on tour. Uh, that's true. We did visit him when he was on tour. Um, uh, you asked a few questions. I'm, how excited I am? Uh, am I? Um, since I was in film school, which is now 20 years ago, uh, I've been writing my scripts to Hans' scores. So he is the person that has been the most inspiring composer to me. Um, and I include Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and Max Richter and everybody else that I listen to in that. So um, it is a dream. Um, I really wanted the sound of this movie to be different than the other films as everything is different in this from the other movies. Um, uh, and how we got him was it was a series of things. It probably culminated in what you're talking about, which is um, the visit when, when he was in Montreal for his show, and we all went to go visit him. But it started with um, an email from me to him saying part of what I've been saying, which is this is not a superhero movie. I know he'd sworn off superhero movies, but I said, yes, they wear costumes. Yes, they have superpowers. Yes, they're going to save people. Um, a lot of the trappings of the superhero genre are going to apply at a su on a superficial level. But at a deeper level, it's a drama. It's a, it's a story about a young woman who's losing control of herself, of her powers. Um, it's a story essentially about a schizophrenic. It just plays out in superhero terms. And so that de-evolution, that sense of, you know, our version of ordinary people or Girl Interrupted um, just played out on a superhero stage, appealed to him. He had an idea for how to do that um, sonically. 
Uh, and that email got him to at least email me back. And then we got on the phone and talked. And that was a call that went well enough that it led to another call. Um, uh, Hans has worked with Lee, our editor, um, and our sound editor, Alex, uh, who also won an Oscar this year for Dunkirk. Um, he's worked with them a lot uh, on the Chris Nolan movies, obviously, um, on Inception and Interstellar and the Dark Knight films. So he had a familiarity with, familiarity with them that helped um, start to close the deal. Uh, and then finally he said, look, I'm going to be in Montreal for my show. Why don't you come um, to the show and then we can meet afterwards in person because we'd actually never met um, in person. And then we can talk more about and it. And you made sure to bring the cast. And I made sure to bring <laughs> Hutch and the crew and Lee and whatever cast was in town. Uh, we brought them all backstage afterwards. We showed them a whole lot of love. And then um, Hans and I spent, um, to his credit, because he had just done like a two-hour um, exhaustive show, we spent about an hour or two together until yep. late in the morning um, uh, just talking about my aspirations for the film and what we could do uh, that would change the sound, potentially, and again, hopefully, of this genre or any kind of movies um, uh definition of score some of it is sound some of it is music um and he continued i guess to get more and more excited about the possibilities until he finally said yes uh your call it's called dark phoenix mm -hmm. uh was it ever going to be called x-men dark phoenix did you ever have another title well i never had another title other than dark phoenix or x-men dark phoenix um it'll be called x-men dark phoenix i believe internationally yeah um just so that the the international, the same way we did with Logan. Yeah. Um, uh, um, I wanted to call it Dark Phoenix um, in this, again, very much the way we wanted to call and Hutch and, and, and Jim Mangold were big proponents of calling Logan Logan as opposed to X-Men Logan uh, in, in the United States to indicate that it's a different kind of film um, and to indicate that it's a more character-driven movie. Um, and for me and for Hutch, just, people who worked on X-Men 3, The Last Stand, that didn't have any trace of Dark Phoenix in the title, um, we really wanted to indicate that this is the Dark Phoenix story and that she's at the center of this story, she's the A-plot of this story, everything around this story revolves um, really centrally around uh, Jean Dark Phoenix um, as uh, really the subject of the movie, not the object of the movie. I'm assuming the rating is PG-13? That's not up to us ultimately, but the intention is for it to be PG-13. Has there, with the success of Deadpool, was there ever any thought, has there ever really been any discussion about X-Men being a darker R-rated movie? Because I could see, I mean, or is it sort of like it, because I think it works as PG-13, but you could also make the argument that a more, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Um, you can speak it to really this. It I mean, I, not that I'm, mostly because the, the depth and the complexity of the characters, there's been nothing we haven't been able to tackle within that, within a PG-13. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Logan was driven by wanting to do something different with the nature of his condition, with the way in which we expressed or represented the violence, with what that, you know, what the accumulation of that in a life. So there were, there were very specific ideas that Jim wanted to explore that required an R, right? In this case, I guess we, w we would and could have had the conversation, but the material didn't really warrant it in that same way. And I think, you know, certainly the way in which you've explored the, the character-based issues of Dark Phoenix, I'd say is darker and in many ways much more intense without necessarily requiring an R. Yeah, I think when you look at... Um... It happens to have dark in the title too. Um, but when you look at Dark Knight, uh, that was a PG thirteen movie, and that tackled some really um, mature subject matter, and was edgier and darker um, uh, and more intense than previous films in the genre had been. But that was still a PG thirteen. So, I, I, like I've said, there was no need for extra swear words. Um, the level of violence in this is intense for a PG thirteen movie, but is still within the bounds of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, you use the classic yellow and blue costumes. Uh, how did that come about? came about that because um, I'm a huge fan of the comics and I finally got to direct one of these movies. So it was pretty simple. <laughs> I was like, I might not get another chance to direct one of these movies. I'm going to put them in those costumes because that's what I grew up um, you know, reading. Uh, was, there, well, was there ever, when you make that decision, where do you have to go up the food chain in terms of getting permission or is it just your decision? Because 
Do you know what I mean? Like, sure. Um, I think in this particular case, it was probably just my decision. Um, because we've worked on so many of these X Men movies um, here at Fox uh, to this point, um, there's a lot of trust um, because we've also had success with them. Um, there's a lot of trust creatively in, in us. Um, so uh, when it comes to things like decisions like that, uh, they're very um, accommodating um, and supportive. Yeah, and they like and they like the choice. Yeah, they're, they like the know, love. Again, one of the benefits of having all worked together, and I include all the studio, um, for so many years, is there is a shorthand, and you know there's trust, but that also translates into a shorthand and a familiarity with each other's sensibilities. So, you know, a lot of those decisions came pretty pretty organically and pretty easily. Um, are there any X Men we haven't seen in previous films joining the cast of Dark Phoenix? There are characters from the X Men comics. Um, uh, that join the cast. Um, X-Men, uh, in terms of the actual members of the X-Men, uh, I would say no. no. Um, uh, I think this is probably my, my final question for now. Uh, uh, what For both of you, what do you want fans of the X-Men movies to know about this movie? I'll take that first, if you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I want them to know that I was, we all made this movie... Um, wanting to be as true as possible to the source material. And there's lots of different source material for the Dark Phoenix story, whether it be the cartoons or the comics. Um, but to take ingredients from all of those different um, uh, core um, uh, sources and create something that will feel familiar to them because they love it and will feel new to them because that's the responsibility of adapting into film. Um, and I guess I would say um, at the risk of a sort of mea culpa, that I regret not being able to fully tell the Dark Phoenix story in X3, um, that that became the B plot of the movie, not the A plot of the movie. The Kier plot became um, the primary plot of that film. And ever since then, and that's longer than I, I care to remember, a lot, it was a long time ago, that's 10 plus years ago, um, that we made that movie. Um, ever since then, I've wanted to tell the Dark Phoenix story and tell it um, so that new audiences could be as excited about it and um, sort of awe-inspired by it as I was when I was a kid reading it, and that old audiences like me um, could have a nostalgia for the um, original story and also find something new in it uh, and feel like, ah, finally I'm seeing the Dark Phoenix story on a huge movie screen um, told properly. Yeah, I, I obviously echo what, what Simon was saying. The only thing I'd add is, I guess... In each one of these now, and certainly in the comic book universe in general, you really feel the challenge and the obligation to try to to try to advance the form because the the bar keeps getting raised. You know, movie, movie, movie after movie. You know, whether it's the more recent Avengers or it's you know Guardians of the Galaxy or or Deadpool or Logan or you know they're all pushing out in different ways. And I think you know, in addition to trying to honor the the underlying material. The other challenge that we hope we fulfilled is is to dig a little deeper or a little bit differently into the material and into these characters in a way that makes you that brings you closer to them in a new way. That's that's part of my hope with with the film is that while while yes you're getting some of the experience in, a, in another chapter in a beloved saga with characters you know and have a relationship with, you're also getting to see see them in new ways. Yeah. And that's certainly one of the one of the hopes and aspirations. Uh, I was going to say, uh, for the two of you, I know you have to get back to editing, but I want to, one more time for people that are joined who may be at the end of this or in the middle or whatever, I'm going to pan to the right so people can see. Uh, this is what the editing room looks like. So that's the screen, some screens. And uh, um, so this is, this is basically where they're making X-Men Dark Phoenix. I'm pushing... Right, pan back to us. Pan back to us. Right, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people that are going to screen grab stuff. And... Yeah, sorry. I don't, I'm not trying to get you in trouble. That's all right. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, listen. Thanks so much for, uh, uh, for talking to me. And uh, I can't wait to talk uh, when the movie's done. Awesome. Excellent. Let Thank me... you.